first, thank you all for being here. Um, this lecture we're giving today is the result of some of the ODI's innovation program, uh, for which the first year ended um, in March this year. And we're presenting uh, one of the projects that we've worked on, on uh, AI, part of a uh, broader program looking at emerging technology. And I wanted to uh, thank two of our colleagues who worked on this. And this was a, a team effort from the whole of the ODI team, but I wanted to uh, single out uh, Jamie Fawcett and Jared Keller, who co-authored the report that this talk is based on. I'm giving the floor to Lucy Anna. OK, cool. Thank you, Olivier. So recently, there's been a lot of excitement around um, artificial intelligence. And large uh, companies have made huge investments on uh, this technology, such as IBM, which has invested £15 billion pound alone on their uh, cognitive system, Watson. And from PwC, who estimated that artificial intelligence could add $15.7 trillion to the global GDP by 2030. And so all these big numbers and all this bold pronouncement have shown that um, AI is actually has a huge potential in improving our lives. But first of all, why AI and what is it? So more and more businesses have been using AI to help them make decisions. For example, where to invest, what route to take, or even what movie to watch. So that really shows how AI is uh, being more and more present in our daily life. But first of all, how does it really work? So think of it as a black box, where you put lots of data in it, such as um, pictures, and also taste, and as well as your social interactions. And from all this, this returns to you with decisions, recommendations, as well as uh, pattern recognition. There's many types of AI systems, as you can see, and it's very confusing uh, to, see, to actually think of what actually AI is. So here's what we think it is. Artificial intelligence systems are a combination of clever statistical and mathematical techniques, an understanding of the world, and lots of data. So the current trend uh, within AI businesses is to treat large sets of data um, that we fit into uh, AI systems and that we use to train. In, and, then, and, then, and then we silo that data. So we, instead of making it public um, or share it. Um, and that, if that continues, this will actually lead to uh, negative effects such as oligopoly, which means that that would stop innovation. And thinking that AI systems use data to train um, their, their algorithm, uh, if they can't have access to that data, it means that fewer businesses or startups um, can actually make, um, make their own um, new AI systems. And this is actually a natural tendency that um, researchers have, uh, have found, have, uh, have noticed. And this is partly due to the fact that this is a self-feeding data ecosystem, which means that those who have the most data can train the best AI systems. And obviously, the ones that have the best AI systems collect the most data. So that goes uh, round and round. And um, so one of that, uh, one of um, most famous examples could be um, the tech giant Facebook and its famous algorithm, which I'll hand to Olivier for that. Thank you, Lucy. So it's worth thinking for a moment. Um, we've been talking about artificial intelligence systems and data, 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 data. Typically, in our kind of collective narrative, when we talk about artificial intelligence systems, we hear a lot that word, algorithm. And I wanted to spend a few minutes kind of unpicking what that, world, that word means in the context of AI and why we still think that uh, data is a, a more important word and one that needs to come as an equal in the conversation about AI. Now, 
caveat, AI is a moving target, AI is using a lot of buzzwords, and AI is really badly defined. Uh, one of the experts we talked to as part of our research said something that I really like, that we need different words for AI. Now, for the time being, we're kind of stuck with the ones that we've got, but know that it is a moving target and that the definitions and the word that we're using are going to change. For one thing, one of the really good definitions that I've heard about AI is AI is basically the field of computer science of stuff that doesn't work yet. Once it works, we just call it computer science. So keep that in mind. But let's, look, let's have a look a little bit at what we mean by algorithms when we talk about artificial intelligence. So as Lucia was, was saying, a, a, a typical analogy for, um, uh, for AI systems is, is a black box. But if we open the black box, typically, and it's important to remember that typically doesn't mean in every case, because there is a really, really broad set of techniques, a really, really broad set of applications that we lump under that term AI. But typically, what happens is that inside that box, you've got a lot of data, typically training data, although uh, it's worth noting that in some cases, such as uh, if you've heard of uh, GANs, like the, uh, the system that powers uh, alpha zero, you don't actually have training data. But in the overwhelming majority of cases, an artificial intelligence system will have been trained with a lot of data. This icon here is my uh, feeble attempt at conveying that uh, there's a lot of statistics happening and a lot of methods to deal with this data. Uh, you are modeling the world, you're using statistical techniques to optimize something, and that something is, uh, in some cases, uh, a neural network, in some cases other things, but let's look at this as a model of the world that has been trained on testing data with uh, statistical techniques. So far so good? You, you, you take some data, you use it to train a model using statistical methods. Then you take this model that you've just trained and you give it input data and you get stuff, insights, recommendations, and so on and so forth. So you see I talked earlier about uh, taking our taste and so on and so forth. So in here, our taste, our... Um, history of watching stuff, reading stuff, et cetera, et cetera, plus some statistics, G gives us a model of what we like. Then we say, today I want something, and it gives us recommendations, for instance. What's interesting uh, when we look at uh, what typically is called the algorithm, and there's a lot of the talk of the algorithm when talking about Facebook, is that we talk about this. The algorithm is the result. The, the algorithm is what is shown to us as uh, as output to, our, to all our input. But when you talk to data scientists that work on that black box, what they call algorithms is the set of techniques that they use to train the artificial intelligence system. So already, algorithm is a bit of a, a complex, complex thing. What's interesting, however, is whatever definition of algorithm you use, a lot of the time, those algorithms are open. That is, the techniques that are being used to train artificial intelligence systems, the software being used to uh, use the model that you have trained, tend to be open source. There's a lot, lot, lot uh, of the software being used to train and then use the models that are open source. And they're all based on mathematics that have been published in, say, the 70s and 80s. There, are, there is, of course, quite a lot of research and kind of cutting edge AI uh, algorithms that are being published right now, but the overwhelming majority of the algorithms being used in AI are open. And the reason behind that is uh, that we, we have now a relatively mature uh, open source movement that is able to be convincingly making the case that open source for those algorithms create better transparency, uh, that you have uh, more scrutiny over the code that is being used to train and then uh, power of those models, and collaboration. You don't have to reinvent the wheel because you can reuse software that somewhere else built and, the, and you can collaborate in it and make it, and make it better. What's, what's interesting then is looking at how the perception and the behavior of organizations that 
use AI today do with regards to data. And I'm going to give the floor back to Lucia uh, with this quote that much of the, the new hype on AI is based on uh, better hardware to run these uh, algorithms that are not particularly new and a lot, lot, lot of data. So let's look at how those organizations deal with data. Thank you, Olivier. So let's have a closer look at data. Um, so providing access to data and to the algorithm is not a binary choice. It's not just a yes or no. It's more of, um, so obviously, yes or no, do you want to share? And what do you want to share? With whom you want to share? And how you want to share it? And to describe this um, access to data, uh, we here at the ODI like to use this ODI data spectrum, um, which, this, which you can see from the very left-hand side. It's, it shows um, where organizations choose not to share anything at all with mm, any external um, organizations. And to the very... Um, Right. Um, this is actually the, the other extreme. It's publishing as open data with a license that enables anyone to share, access, and use data. And in between, you can see that there's also very different uh, ways of sharing. It's either you can share with someone in particular or a selected group. And also, you can also share publicly, but um, with a restrictive license. And as for algorithms, we have found that in our research that it works pretty much the same, the same way. That's why we came up with this quadrant. And we have, broadly, um, we have broadly defined uh, archetypes and trends that um, we think that uh, businesses using AI are using to approach um, data, and the access to data and the access to algorithms. So you can see that the, ver the very top is open algorithm, at the very end is closed algorithm, and then at the very left is closed data, and then open data here. And we can, um, so this is by no means uh, categorizing any products or services, it's just to give a broad idea of how um, businesses approach the access to um, data and the access to algorithm in order to create a competitive advantage. And we have uh, so seen a trend here um, that goes towards the top left-hand side of this quadrant. So the trend is leaning towards open algorithm and closed data. And the reasons for that is that they want to open up their um, algorithm in order for other companies to use it and to build on it and so that they can identify any potential or existing issues uh, alongside with any potential um, benefits. And then a second reason for opening up that their algorithm is um, to speed up adoption um, of new, new methods or new ways of operating. And this can be seen um, in many interviews that we've led is that a lot of businesses have the desire to, um, to help the AI community progress. Um, but then why do we keep data closed? So I'm going to hand this over to Olivier. So the first reason we heard uh, when exploring with roughly the, the 20 organizations we interviewed in, in this research of why they, um, they were relatively convinced by open source um, is not very good news to uh, those of us who advocate for open data. Um, we'll, we'll look in, in, in a little bit of, uh, at, at why they don't typically want to open the data that they do hold, but they were, there was actually some hostility to using open data at all in uh, their AI systems. Um, this is uh, exemplified by this quote from um, Anvali Back from uh, a, um, a VC uh, organization, uh, a pan-European uh, VC uh, funder, who, who says that 
in the organizations that she talks to, they barely use open data because they think that if they use open data, it might not have the relevance and the quality that they really need to train the algorithm. And that's bad news because if you work in data science, you know that 80, 90% of your work is actually dealing with data that is messy, dirty, not 100% relevant. So in the open data movement, we have work to do to kind of counter the expectation that open data should be better than this. Either it means that we need to get the message out there that there is high quality open data available to uh, train AI systems, or actually fix them so that they are uh, better at being used for AI systems. Uh, but it, it's not all a negative reaction to open data. There's actually quite a lot of, uh, of, of uh, arguments being presented by those organizations we talk to that we're not about saying, we don't like open data, we don't use it, but we hold data and, we're not, and we want to keep it closed for a number of reasons. And I'm going to let Lucia talk you through some of those reasons we heard. Thank you. So we have um, talked to a couple of businesses and we've asked them why they were reluctant in sharing their data, open up their data. And they came up with two reasons. So first of all is personal data. So data itself is already a sensitive topic. And if we add personal data, um, this adds one more layer of difficulty because of uh, privacy reasons. And um, we have Roma from Frosha, who expressed it quite succinctly um, when we asked him whether um, they would benefit uh, from data that was siloed, um, uh, whether that would help them create or innovate. And this is what he says. Um, of course, we would be able to develop more business models out of that. But as a citizen, I would probably object to that. It's with good right, there are some silos. And this approach is quite common um, when we talk about uh, data about people within businesses. Obviously, there are access to data that should be restricted um, because, um, because of personal, personal, uh, personal reasons or privacy reasons. Uh, unless they have given a um, explicit consent to that. And besides privacy issues, uh, there's also business, re business reasons for keeping that data limited uh, or closed. And that's um, due to trust. So that would retain trust from their customers and also avoid uh, some potential regulatory issues. Um, however, obviously, this business reason is justifiable, um, but many companies use this as an excuse to keep the data they have as proprietary data. So proprietary, proprietary data is the second reason why um, businesses are reluctant to share um, their data. And this um, proprietary data um, is a form of um, companies' IP, so interne um, intellectual property, um, they see it as their market advantage and they don't want to, to disclose that. Obviously, that's also a valid reason, but only if um, those data have anything to do with uh, profit or um, their loss. So that would be um, understandable that they don't want to share this data. And um, obviously, that would mean that um, if, this, if less data is shared, then um, there would be um, less innovation as well. And knowing that AI systems uh, need uh, loads of data to train itself, um, it also means that there is a limited um, with this limited data, they could lead to a lot of bias. And as Sandra says, so if we talk to uh, machine learning people, um, if you don't have a rich data set, then you will actually start discriminating people because there is bias in the data set. And I'll hand over to Olivier to um, yeah. give you two interesting examples. 
I'll, I'll stay with this quote for, for a moment because there's, there's, a, there's a double uh, whammy here. One is silos lead to lack of diversity in training data sets, which indeed means that bias can creep in. But also worth remembering is that analogy of the black box that we talked about a few times. Most artificial intelligence systems at the moment are black boxes. Uh, AI systems are very bad at explaining why they came to decisions that they came to. Partly because of the way they're built, you've got a, a set of weights in a neural network, it doesn't really tell you I did this because of that. Now there's a lot of research going on at the moment to figure out ways for AI systems to be self-explanatory, but at the moment, the only scrutiny we have on AI systems is whatever is uh, available to us to query it. So we can use a, a, an AI system and go, oh yeah, there's a problem here. But at the moment, mostly what we've got is the code, which I said, as, as we said a, a few times earlier, tends to be open. So the code that is used to train AI tends to be open, but the data is closed. And therefore, the scrutiny on what the data that has been used to train an AI, and therefore what bias might have been in that data, because they are typically held in silos and held as property or personal, property IP or, or, or personal data, they are not, you can't go and look at that and look at it for, uh, for bias. Which leads to some pretty uh, egregious uh, discriminatory uh, systems. So those are a couple of examples that are a few years old. You've got a few more that are a little more subtle, but in order to make my, my case, I think those are, are, are good examples. This is an example of what happened when Google, holder of quite a lot of data and quite a lot of resources to make sure that their systems are not uh, massively racist, released a, a feature in their photo software that was very conveniently um, uh, sorting out photos uh, based on topics. And probably because it had been trained with mostly uh, photos of white people as, as the exemplar of what a person is, it, uh, it then classified uh, photos of this, uh, this person's friend, so Jackie Elstein was, uh, was the person who raised the issue with Google. This person's friend, with dark skin were uh, classified by the algorithm uh, as gorillas. Now you can, you can be pretty sure that Google was not intending to do that. So that's not bias that is intended. Sometimes you, you do have a view of the world and you're trying for it to be reflected in your AI system. In this case, that was not the case. And that is largely the, uh, due to the fact that there was no way to test for that kind of bias until someone was able to put their photos um, in the system and, and, and see that. Another example that, uh, that is uh, tragically uh, funny uh, is uh, from 2010, Nikon, multinational company, but you know, Japan-based, released a new camera with a really nice feature that helps you take better, fi better photos. And when, what it does is it's trained on uh, facial, facial features and tells you when someone's blinking. And this person, Jaws Wang, on the picture here, uh, kept taking photos of herself and her family, and the camera kept saying, did someone blink? Up to the point that her brother had to basically test how badly he had to like, artificially open his eyes for the camera to stop saying that. And that again is, is a pretty egregious case of a training set with some inherent bias. In this case, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the camera application was trained on f feature uh, mostly from Caucasian faces and therefore did not take into account that actually across the world there are many more types of faces and types of uh, shapes of eyes that might be mistaken for, for someone blinking. So what, what then? We've, uh, we've talked you through the fact that we talked to quite a lot of organizations and told you that um, most of them tend to go to the top left of the quadrant using open source software to build their AI systems and, and power those AI systems, but st sticking with closed data. I could be mean and say, if you want to know what we recommend as next steps, read the report. Please do read the report, it's good. But let's very quickly go through some of the things that we think are the, the right next step. The first one is a note of optimism. While a lot of the um, popular imagination around AI 
um, revolves around tech giants, the Googles, the Facebook, the, the Apples of this world. Actually, most of the unlocking of value through AI is probably not going to be done by those, by those organizations, but by organizations that sit on a lot of data and don't know what to do with. Those are the organizations that we think have the opportunity to test other models than the uh, closed data uh, as personal or proprietary IP uh, um, uh, parameter. There are ways to, uh, for uh, a company holding a lot of data to not say, yeah, we're going to build an AI on that, but maybe they're going to partner with others. Maybe they're going to work with experts in the field to uh, create systems with that data that they hold. But that means a few things. That means that bit of optimism, much of the data, world's data is yet to be unlocked. But that means that, means that we need better data sharing uh, and access while retaining trust. If you look at the recent scandals or, or, or problems around uh, a, AI, both the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal, and a little earlier, the issues that uh, DeepMind had with their data sharing agreement with the Royal Free Hospital, those were well-meaning data sharing agreements that backfired spectacularly. And we think that the problem is not with the concept of sharing or giving access to data, but the problem is that we don't, we're, we're at the infancy of figuring out data sharing agreements and data sharing models. So we've started a, a project a, uh, a few months ago trying to categorize, classify, understand, and explain data sharing and data access models so that companies and organizations can pick and mix and pick and choose the ones that work for them while retaining trust, while not ending up with, yeah, lawyer says it's okay, and then two years down the line, you end up with a massive scandal and really bad publicity. And in order to unlock data that people think, well, there might be some personal data, so we're, not, we're gonna keep it closed because we don't wanna take the risk. We, we acknowledge that, that is, that is a, a fact that there is a risk, and especially now with, um, the, uh, the UK's implementation of GDPR, the uh, Data Protection Bill, that is going to make uh, willful um, re-identification of people when using data um, a crime, felony, misdemeanor, I'm a lawyer, I'm definitely not a lawyer, but a bad thing, then we need to, to help organizations deal with that risk rather than go binary no, we're not going to do this because there might be a risk of re-identification and I don't want to end up in jail because someone somewhere re-identified data that I, that I shared because there was some personally identifiable data in there. So we've started this second project to uh, help organization uh, better uh, manage risk when dealing with data sharing, data access, and in some cases, opening data. That's it from us. Thank you. Uh, Hannah, I'm supposed to give you the microphone, so I'm going to do that right now. Are there any questions, any comments, any concern, anything that wasn't clear? Hi, thank you. That was really great. Um, my question is, at the start, um, especially with that um, sort of matrix of like open algorithms and open data, you're actually talking about open data, but by the end, you're talking about risk management and access to personal data. And that makes sense to me because most of the applications for AI are with personal data. Mm. Um, I'm wondering if you have examples where open data is truly, regardless of whether a venture capitalist thinks that it's relevant, <coughs> where, uh, examples where uh, algorithms can and should be trained on open data. and, and cause I feel like I'm a bit muddied between personal data and open data in, what, in, in the narrative. Shall I answer um, if you want? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, there's a few examples uh, out there of successful uh, data sets being used to train uh, AI. Um, I'll, I'll mention just two. Uh, one is uh, OpenCV, which is used for computer vision. So pretty big data set of things and, uh, and categorizing things in computer vision is really, 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 really hard, but at the same time, done. It's a, it's a solved problem. So there's a, there, are, there are good data sets for that. There's good data sets for um, uh, um, kind of 
uh, linguistics, computer linguistics. Uh, and one of the examples that we have in the report is a project uh, by Mozilla to open the data set they use to train their voice recognition. So it, it can be done, but you, you'll see there that what's interesting is that those are data sets that are specifically made to be used uh, to train AI and not just random open data sets that, are, that happen to be yeah, somewhere. Yeah, collected by a business. Okay. <clears throat> yes, you start at the beginning with, uh, let's say, some kind of box, data box, called like you, you I mean, what do you mean by data box? Well, I mean, my question is, when it comes to the question, uh, you have the data, you are running this AI, mm -hmm. but of course, you have to run in some kind of infrastructure, some support, mm -hmm. because I think in this box, you have big data, you have AI, so where do they run? In other words, right. that box, yeah. where that is start it? at the beginning, I figure myself like a data cube, where mm -hmm. you can have a lot of data analysis. So this means the AI is not just, let's say, analytics, data, but it's also infrastructure. This means all together, I see AI. That's my, that's my observation. Do you want me to answer that, or do you want to? Wait, we can share. OK, so um, I want to be part of this. Um, so the, the black box is a, is a metaphor to um, uh, explain why it's so hard to understand at the moment what uh, AI typically does. Um, the, the way to explain this metaphor is that um, you can, if you've got a dog, you can understand why, you kind of, kind of understand why the dog does what they do. Like, oh yeah, well there's food there, so they're salivating. You kind of understand that, but you can actually not really understand that by just opening their head and looking into it. I mean, you can put electrodes and perhaps figure some patterns that relate to seeing food and being hungry, but we're not, uh, in the same way as neuroscience doesn't really have a grasp of exactly what is happening and, and, and why, it, we create systems in AI that we can't really understand. We know what comes in, so training data, we know what comes out, decision, pattern recognition, and so on and so forth, but there, there's an aura of magic because it's so hard to exactly explain the why. It's very, very hard to create a system that says, yes, I gave you this, uh, this response because of that. The, the answer typically is, I gave you this response because you trained me with some data, I don't know. Mm. Uh, but the, the, your, the, the second part of your answer, the, the infrastructure, yeah. do you want to answer that? So, so it's, uh, thank you very much for mentioning the infrastructure. So I think um, from our research, actually, um, this infrastructure is is basically the fact that we have more and more data. We are able to have access to loads of data nowadays, 21st century, compared to, um, to the past, because the AI system itself is not, it's nothing new. It's just that right now, we have more and more data to fit in. Mm. And that's why mm. we're able to develop more, to have um, better trained AI systems. So um, hope this answers your question, sir. Yeah, um, you are right. I, I, think, I think this black box will be eliminated once you are able to combine the infrastructure. For example, that's why IBM, you mentioned 15 million, no? Yeah. Okay. They spend 15 this million, 15 billion, 15 yeah. billion etc. Yeah. But this is mainly to link infrastructure with AI. Because if you have this type of, uh, say, I, I see different type of teams that it goes from infrastructure to the data scientist to the developer to monitoring to go back, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, it's, IBM has been working already with Cognos. Cognos does the same of things. So this means it's the same idea of Cognos, just reabolated in different way. It's more complex. That's where I see AI and the utility of AI. Mm -hmm. Um, so from my perspective, I think these challenges of getting the companies who are sitting on this data to open up are probably almost insurmountable. So 
Firstly, like the competitive advantage of this data for most of these companies, this is the main thing they have is that they have the data. Like you say, the algorithms are known and they're not going to have as good engineers as uh, Google, Facebook and the others. So this is all they have as a way of competing. And it's also a barrier to other people from competing with them. So uh, I work for a search engine company and we would not be able to... So first, without having some initial data to start with, you just cannot even start. Yeah. And you're so far behind Google, you're never going to catch up. So there's a massive disincentive to open this data. Um, then on the other aspect, the risk, this is also extremely high. So um, I work on the uh, privacy aspect of it. And even data sets that companies think are de-anonymized mm. are not. So there's a classic example is the Netflix um, mm. yeah. data challenge, where they uh, published a data set that they thought they'd anonymized to see if people could come up with better recommendations. And researchers proceeded to de-anonymize de the people. And these are people who know this the best. Um, mm. There's many, many data sets. And also, the more public data sets there are, um, the easier it gets to de-anonymize because these can be cross-referenced. Um, so I wonder if you have any other insights about if this is So uh, Lucia can talk in, in more details about the organizations that we've seen that do actually manage to find uh, uh, ways uh, to find other models than the closed data uh, open algorithms. Uh, but what, what I'll say to, to, to begin our answer is <clears throat> it's better to again, think not just as a binary choice of open versus closed, but more on, on a spectrum. And a, a, lot of, a lot of answers are going to be, it's not a binary thing. So uh, full, uh, foolproof, total, infinite, forever anonymization is nearly impossible, unless you go uh, and, and you know, mangle the data to the point that it's unusable. We get that. But you know, managing risk is not about binary uh, full, full, no risk, and full risk. You kind of you know what the risk you are that you're taking, and then you and then you make your choices accordingly. And likewise, opening. We're not we're not saying uh, through this that all AI should be based on completely open data, and that all uh, organizations should open data entirely. But we're we're saying that the model of closed data, open algorithms that is preferred might not be the best for everyone. Lucia, did you have examples uh, of successful organizations outside of this top left quadrant? Um, well, there's Frosha, which we, we mentioned a couple of times. So this, com this is a Dutch startup um, based in Amsterdam. And they, they, collect, they, they, they collect actually uh, personal data. And this new GDPR law is, they say that there was actually uh, beneficial to them. So what they do is that they, they collect those personal data, then they anonymize them, and then they give it to, um, to they, they sell it to companies. So they have a open algorithm, um, but sort of shared, shared exactly, sort of um, shared data. So that's why at some point in the, in the quadrant, we have a shared model in the very uh, middle of the quadrant, um, which is, where we see a lot of companies that is that actually tends to move toward this uh, shared model because they see that collaboration and partnerships is actually uh, makes it easier for them to open their data because there's more trust uh, building uh, during this whole process. Yeah, hi, I noticed a trend in enriching web pages with structured data to enable natural language processing in search. What trend, how, how, you see, how you see this coming and where can people find more information to enhance their web pages in that way, or upsides, downsides? Um, I'm going I'm to try and answer, but I think the, uh, your, your neighbor uh, behind you working on search engines might, might have more knowledge. So don't, don't throw a uh, water bottle at me if my answer is wrong. Uh, I, I'm going to answer somewhat uh, broadly in the sense that um, if, you can't, if you count the web as uh, data that is 
publicly available. Most of the web is, is dirty and messy, and any effort to increase the structure of it will, uh, not automatically, but will very be, be very likely to help people then use that structured uh, information. Is that, is that essentially what I, you're... I, I, I'm, I mean, going is? beyond the semantic, think mm -hmm. about it, get perfectly everything marked up, but then you enhance it with structured data. Mm -hmm. this, this process is quite com complex, complicated. For many organizations, we've got 99.7 percent SMEs in this country and they have absolutely no clue about that mm -hmm. so so how can they approach this topic otherwise they will they won't be in search soon I mean we've got quite a lot of it working already there there you know um, natural language processing techniques are again not not entirely new uh, what's important is that to, to realize that they are useful only to some extent. Um, in my previous role before joining the ODI, uh, my team was actually building natural language processing uh, to kind of understand the web better. And the joke was that we surprisingly failed time and time again to build an algorithms that, that, that would detect sarcasm. Not sure why. But we were still able to to automate quite a lot of the understanding of content out there uh, through fairly effective machine learning uh, techniques. So the, the key is to understand for what it is usable for and what it is not usable for. So understand where the uh, um, uh, the efficacy and the uh, and the accuracy of those uh, methods are. Okay, so have the final question here. Yeah, thanks for the lecture. It was very interesting. I think something that maybe well, also interesting to add is the fact that when you're talking about data and the fact that they can be, um, that you have to be sure on the kind of data that you plug in actually to the machine learning. Apart from having like good quality data, um, something that is also like worth it, I think, add is uh, the biases towards the kind of people that actually like plugging in that data. Because like a big thing on that on on this uh, topic is also about uh, having more diverse team working on that mm -hmm. data thing. So like open source is actually like a very good thing to kind of uh, um, avoid having. I mean, kind of shaping actually, an unbiased future, a biased future. But I think something that is also very important adding is uh, working on creating a device a diverse team to avoid that. I don't know if you answer that, but other than nodding, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. Um, as you can see on the screen here, uh, the R&D project uh, funded by the UK government is still ongoing. Um, research is still happening, so if you'd like to collaborate with the team, uh, find out more about what we're doing, uh, please do get in touch, uh, info at theodi.org. Can we please give Olivier and Lucia a big round of applause? <laughs>